Hey, so today we're here with our buddy Jim Clare. He is the first trainee at a starting strength gym to deadlift 600 pounds. So um, yeah, when we started this company, I, I didn't know how strong people would actually get. I didn't know how committed people would be. Um, I assumed it'd be kind of like a jujitsu school where you've got a whole bunch of white belts and then maybe a couple of uh, brown belts and very few black belts. Uh, well, well, Jim is getting to the, the high levels of, uh, of training as a non- you know, competitive uh, strength sport athlete. A um, 600 pound deadlift is pretty, pretty damn impressive. You know, our strength standard is, is 500 pounds, which, uh, you know, that's, I believe that's a high standard. And then Jim is 100 pounds above that. And, and as you know, when you look at the graph of diminishing returns, when it comes to uh, how to build strength over time, going from 500 to 600 is a hell of a lot slower than going from 400 to 500. So let's talk to Jim today. He's, uh, he's a trainee at Starting Strength Denver. Um, there is a video of him on YouTube that I interviewed him that I'm not in, um, where he's just talking about his first little while at starting straight Denver and the weight he's gained and the numbers he put up on the bar. Um, so Jim, why don't, why don't we start there, man? What, what were your numbers across all your lifts when you started with Jared Nesland and Jay Livesey and Amanda Shepard at starting straight Denver? How long has it been and what are your numbers now? So when I first got in, uh, the numbers, cause Amanda, Jeez. Because Amanda started me off. I mean, I had a background in lifting before, but I think my form was pretty terrible. So Amanda started me off, I think, pretty low. So I think my my squat was somewhere around a little over 275. And I think my deadlift was probably around the same. Uh, so we'll say 275. It might have been a little bit higher, but I'm pretty sure that's where I started for like the very first day. And then, yeah, bench was, uh, and <laughs> I benched okay before. So it was, it was probably, uh, it's probably like 185, I think, just to get me started on the form because my elbows would flare out pretty crazy. Uh, and press was uh, under, yeah, God, I don't know, because I had, you know, I've dislocated my right shoulder a bunch of times. And so my press was probably, I think we maybe started around, around 100, I want to say. Do you remember your PRs on each of those lifts before coming into the gym, regardless of form? It was a long time. So I used to, uh, ages ago in college, I used to do that body by Boyle uh, thing. He had a center here or not here uh, when I lived in Boston, I'm from Boston originally. Uh, it was probably, maybe I did a, a 405 squat, but it was probably terrible form and really high. Uh, I mean, I know I had like a, I think I might've done a, like a 275 front squat. I mean, it was a long time ago. So I was what, 20, 21 years old then. So that was 20 years ago. So I, I didn't really have a concept of, of PRs. I know on bench, I couldn't, I, I could barely get above 235. Uh, and on squats, my depth was pretty high. My form was, you know, it was, it was much more of a high bar. It's pretty vertical. But I mean, like 315, even when it was really high, was a, it was like a battle. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you remember the deadlift? Oh, God. Uh, I have probably haven't deadlifted since college. So yeah, I have no idea. I mean, I, I'd, I'm going to guess and say it was 315, but I really have no idea. Gotcha. Because after I, I had injured my back skiing, um, so I was a little bit fearful of the deadlift. Yep. Uh, I mean, I did it a couple of times, but the form was, I mean, like the bar wasn't any, wasn't against my shins. It was just kind of hanging out there. So it was almost like the semi weird, uh, straight leg row kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what are your PRs now at starting strength Denver? My, um, it's a deadlift 600 pounds. Uh, squat, I did a single for 545. Before I, I went to LA last week, my singles were, I think, at 540. And I was, what, at, uh, if I didn't go, I would have done 495 for my five by fives. So I'm kind of like, damn, why did I, <laughs> why did I schedule that trip? <laughs> but so I did 495 by five. Uh, but yeah, 545 was a squat single, 315 on the bench. And uh, press was 185. So press and, press and bench, I'm still working on a lot. Um, well, good. So it's kind of... Well, good. Yeah. I'm glad I press more than you do, you know? 
<laughs> yeah, I, yeah, my press, you wouldn't, if you saw me press, you would not guess my, my deadlift. Would be six. <laughs> You'd be like, ah, it's 315. <laughs> Let's talk about that in this training week, because you've been pretty damn consistent. How many sessions have you missed since you started and how long has it been? So I started right when it opened. So I think that was what the first week of January, 2020, right around then. Yep. Two years ago. Uh, yeah. So I haven't, I haven't missed a week. This week was the first week I missed and it was Generally, when I I kind of try to schedule anything, you know, like I leave on a Monday or a Sunday and then come back on, uh, you know, Wednesday or Thursday, so that way I can get my lifts in. And in some places, I tr I try to get the lifts in, so I don't miss. But I uh, I didn't realize it was New Year's Eve and my class was at 11 a.m. So I showed up at 4:15 ready to go. Just I missed it. So it was the first week I missed. <laughs> Shit. Uh, so. In, yeah, just about two years. Well, let's make that the first lesson of this conversation, which is, uh, you know, people talk about how, to, how does Chase Lindley press 405 kind of stuff all the time, right? And the answer is he does not miss a training session. Um, he doesn't miss a training session. And his technique is dialed in because he's training under, under the guidance of a coach. And then his programming is dialed in as well. Um, let's talk about those two things in either order, whatever order makes sense for you. Uh, Give us your thoughts on programming and technique and, uh, uh, you know, whether or not you agree with me about those being fundamental to your success and just in general, what it's like to be coached and, and why that's important. Well, I, I think it's key. I think a big misconception that people have with starting strength is, is it's just three by five on, you know, four exercises and you don't do anything else, period, which is, you know, wrong. So obviously that's the novice linear progression. You go through that. And then once you get beyond it, I mean, the great thing with the coaching is, uh, you know, they understand what your body type is, where you're weak, you know, if you have any aches or pains or what your goals are or what you have coming up. So we knew that I was going to go away, you know, this week, uh, you know, so that's why we, we kind of altered things a little bit coming up. Uh, also, I'm going to be skiing a fair amount this, this winter. But the other thing is, is you have to be disciplined with that. You kind of have to throw yourself to the process into the coach and, and give feedback. So that way they know if you need to be doing a halting deadlift or if you need to be doing rack pull. Um, like my deadlift started, you know, when I first started getting really heavy, but, you know, clean was kind of wasn't catching up. So they, you know, put me on rack pulls and I was responding much better to that. Whereas, you know, so other people, you know, it could be the opposite thing where they do much better with the cleans and the rack pulls versus deadlift. And that's going to be something that you're going to have to, you know, give feedback to your coach, which takes time. And that's the other thing is, is taking the time, um, you know, and, and trusting that, you know, the coach's eye and the starting strength, because the coaches take, you know, it's a long process to get in there. I mean, I got back from the vacation, you know, it's three by five, 445. I'm squat. I'm like, come on, I'm like 490. <laughs> but, you know, I'm glad I did the, you know, after sitting on the tarmac for four hours and, and missing, I'm glad I did the 445. So it's a matter of trusting you know, what they're doing with, with your body and everything. Speaking of the rack pull, um, I remember Jay Libsey, the owner of the gym in Denver, sent me a, a video of a guy in his gym rack pulling, you probably know better than I do, is something like 635 uh, for a set of five, I think. Um, yeah. Maybe we can get that, uh, get that video spliced in here. Um, and it was, it was, I didn't recognize the guy in the video. I was like, who is this guy? He's not, he's not super heavy. Um, and, Cause you've lost some weight since the last time we interviewed you. So what's, what's your height and body weight now? And how has that fluctuated over time? So when I first started, I was 195. Um, and then I, and you're a six footer. Yeah. I'm six foot two or just, just a little over six foot two. Mm -hmm. um, and then I put on, and then I got all the way up to 234. And then when I did a DEXA, I put on 19 pounds of lean body mass. Um, and I was working with Rob Santana for a bit at Weights and Plates. And pretty much I've been doing uh, the vertical diet. Uh, I mean, for, for a long time. Because Rob helped me get my calories uh, in check. Because before that, I was eating one meal a day for almost four years. So he kind of, so he helped, he was great to help me wean, wean off of that and then kind of line up what I need to be doing. Um, and then once he, you know, he kind of got me to the right place, you know, the vertical diet, I liked it, it worked. So I got up to 234. The problem was with, I, you know, I liked it because it was feeling good on the lifts, 
but it was coming in a little bit to you know, my professional work. Uh, you know, getting because I was four thousand calories plus. You know, if I was if I hit forty two hundred, I'd I'd eat it. You know, I would just try to eat as much as I could. But I was starting to like the meals were taking forever to get down. It's a part time job. Uh, yeah, so I was like, I can't. You know, for me, if I'm not writing or reading, because uh, that's a big aspect of what I do, if it cuts into that, it, it starts like my mind starts kind of running all over the place. So I figured, well, if I if I can, so I kind of tested and I told, uh, you know, Amanda Shepard was still my coach. And, you know, I'm going to be between 3,800 to 4,000. I'm not trying to do a cut or anything. I just am struggling, uh, you know, past the 4,200. So I've been pretty, and if I go over 4,000, you know, like when I go out to eat, uh, you know, I try to eat as much as I can, and I'm sure I go way over, but, uh, you know, that's only a couple of times, maybe twice a month or something like that. So I started kind of dialing in right around 3,900, felt pretty good, you know, and if it went over, great. If it was a little bit under, okay. Um, if I knew if I had like heavy squats the next day, I would try to, I don't know, get like a piece of cheese or something in. A little extra. Yeah, so I was a 234, and it, I noticed like I kind of started, started to drop weight a little bit, not fast. Now, I wasn't trying to drop weight, but the lifts were still going up, which I thought was pretty, like I wasn't feeling gassed. So right now I'm at two, I usually in between right around 226 to 228 uh, is where I'm at. So I'm sure it's a little bit of water weight between that difference, but I'd, um, anything, if it goes a little bit below 226, I just make sure that week to, to put up the calories a little bit more. Where, where uh, are you happiest body weight wise since you've kind of, uh, gone up and down around 10 pounds? I'm, I'm the same height as you. I'm 250, uh, without a 600 pound deadlift. Um, what's your, what's your sweet spot? What do you, what do you feel like is best as far as your performance and aesthetics? I mean, I, I like where I am right now. I, I like the 226. I wouldn't want to go any lower than that. Cause I, I imagine that would start affecting the you know, my lifts, um, I'd have no problem going a little bit higher 234. I didn't mind it. It was just maintaining. It was just so much work. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so 226, I like, um, you know, it, it all seems to go to my legs, which isn't a bad thing. So I just got to wear short shorts around you know, <laughs> flex them a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I like between 226 and 230. That seems to work for me. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I would go, I mean, it'd be fun to go over, but it was just, yeah, chewing that much. It was just tough getting the, the, my work done. Yep. Yep. And uh, you are not exaggerating about your commitment to the vertical diet. Cause when I called you last night, asked you what you were doing, you were eating some monster mash. So uh, yeah, I had the monster mash. Yeah. Clearly <laughs> yeah. Stan knows a thing or two about nutrition for, for gaining weight and, and uh, keeping a good body count too. Um, yeah, for sure. Let's talk about skiing because you uh you were a pro skier at one time weren't you well yeah i guess you, i mean i guess you could say that i competed skiing i did freestyle skiing which is the moguls uh the moguls and the two airs uh in college and uh um, yeah and i competed at that so that was what i guess well five years I, I suppose i competed at that and i still ski pretty pretty often not as i don't put in like 100 plus days anymore um I, i've kind of become a I'd rather drink coffee in the lodge or something. <laughs> uh, Welcome to your but, 40s. But, you know, I still, I still try to get in about 20 to 40 days a year, depending on how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, and how I'm feeling is not injuries. It's usually like, yeah, I'll go, I guess I'll go up today. It's, you know, there's no traffic. It's sunny up there. You know, I'll go up. Uh, so, but, I mean, I trained pretty hard during that, that period of time. And I, I mean, I loved it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and mogul skiing is... It's a little bit different than the downhill. Uh, well, it's, it's a lot different than downhill skiing, but it kind of almost works like a sprint. Hmm. Um, you know, and I got a little bit later into competition with it because I was a hockey player before, and then I kind of switched into it, and I, you know, I did pretty well at it. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a lot of it's a lot like a sprint, and then it's tough because you have the two airs. So now these kids are doing flips, and it's just wild. Yep. Yep. Uh, what what's it? Yeah. I have two questions for you. So what, how would your peers respond if you told them that you, uh, you deadlifted 600 pounds firstly, and if you started talking about strength for skiing, do you, is there any benefit there? Well, is, is it, is it worthwhile for a, for an athlete on the slopes? 
I, I think it's incredibly worthwhile. Um, cause one of my good friends, uh, he now coaches the Sun Valley, uh, freestyle ski team. Uh, he's curious. He's really curious about it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, because it's the big thing with the skiers is, you know, like the Olympic cleans would certainly help a lot. And I'm sure it would also help in the downhill skiing, but the strength, you know, you're, you want the strength to prevent the injuries. And obviously you want the strength because it's going to help the balance and you're going to hang on better probably. What do you mean by really, hanging on? So hanging on, so like in the moguls, it's real easy to get into, you don't want to be on your heels at all. Mm. You want to be in the front, you want all of the pressure on the front of your boot. And I noticed since uh, the last two years doing starting strength, I'm like, damn, if I could just go back in time and do this because I'm able to put so much pressure on the front of my boots. Mm. Um, you know, the only thing I had to figure out was how to get a little bit more dynamic, uh, cause it's kind of fun. I can just be like this big beast and just lean forward. Like a missile. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I'm like, I gotta, you know, I gotta work to pump the ski a little bit. Um, uh, but I could tell it's like just getting bucked around. I don't get bucked around up that much at all. Hmm. So that kind of strength to have it is if would be on the balance aspect and one end, uh, you know, if a mogul or something bucks you in the wrong way, half the battle is trying to keep your legs together and then, you know, get back on, on top of the, uh, you know, get in the front of your ski versus in the back. That makes sense. Cause you're moving quickly and your, your skis and legs are under some serious dynamic load, your ability to respond quickly to the changes in load and at various, uh, uh, aspects of your um, balance point and your ability to react quickly and with a lot of pressure and power um, probably makes all the difference, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, and it, I imagine, I mean, I'm not, I didn't race downhill, but downhill, you know, you're carrying G forces if you're really good, okay. but half the battle on the strength is, you know, if you're losing yourself, you need the strength to pull yourself back up into a position of balance. Uh, you know, so if you're strong and you can do that, you know, that's why if you look at, I mean, a lot of them are genetic freaks. If you look at, you know, Lindsey Vaughn or, uh, you know, some of the Austrians, you know, their lower legs are gigantic. Uh, you know, they probably genetically could do a, a huge squat or deadlift right away. Mm -hmm. But that's because they have just that genetic load for strength. And that's what keeps them, you know, they can hang on and you can also get, you know, to gain more speed. And freestyle, you know, they're a little bit skinnier. But you, know, you still need the strength that, you know, if you crash, you'd rather be stronger than weak with all your joints. Yep. Um, you know, because the crashes, you know, if you're the, those aerial crashes are massive. <laughs> like it hurts. You're speaking from uh, experience. Yes. Yeah. yeah. If you, yeah, when you're, if you go for a flip or a spin and all of a sudden, yeah, you're not, you're just like, I, this is going to, this is going <laughs> to, uh, so how does strength help you in a crash? Is it just, I mean, a uh, lot of things is your body's joints? protected. Yeah. Yeah. Your joints. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in my, you know, looking back on things, I think a lot of guys who got injured generally just weren't as strong, mm. you know, so they just suffered with knee injuries. Mm. And obviously, who knows that there's a ton of chance. And I'm not saying if you're, you know, if you can squat 500, you're never going to get a knee injury. Right. Uh, it just lowers but, your risk. You know, it's, right. But it just lowers your risk and probably helps your recovery more so than anything. Yeah. How do you think your peers would, would react to the advice to get their deadlift up to 600 and squat 550 is 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 lifting and skiing common or is it like most other sports where you know the genetic freaks are handpicked uh, and they rely on their inborn talents it's it's probably a little bit twofold because there are i mean there are definite i mean i always think you know those super athletes is always a little bit of an advantage mm -hmm. i mean uh because i remember you know i think it was was it travis mayer uh, so he was a silver medalist. I think I saw him, I believe it was him. I mean, he's like 5'11", or not, he's like 5'10", but he's probably 155 pounds. But he's like, I've, he did a, I think I saw him squat 405. Uh, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure it was him, and I'm pretty sure it was 405. I mean, it was like seven, I mean, it was like 19 years ago. But he's just, you can tell, like, this guy is just so genetically strong. Yeah. Um. But the, the part, the biggest thing is, I think it would be probably 50-50 because some of them understand the aspects that they need strength to prevent the injuries. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I think there is strength to a performance component of it because when I said that hanging on before, some of that's like, you just got to grit your teeth and like pull yourself into a position. So if you're not strong enough to do that, 
Um, and especially with skiing, it's a lot of, you know, core and legs, you know, if you're not strong enough to get back there, you're just, it's gone. Um, and also sometimes when you're gritting and hanging on, you're just trying to sell it to the judges. Like, see, I'm turning, but you know, you're just like, please don't blow up. Mm -hmm. Um, so on one end, I think there's plenty of skiers who do squat and do leg press. I think there's a, I mean, it might've changed now, but there's a little bit of things of worried about squats bad on the knees. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they think leg press is, is easier. Um, you know, I'm not sure if that sentiment changed, but just a misunderstanding. So there's a definite aspect of that to, to, because there's definitely a, a group who want to build the muscles around their knee to keep their knees strong, mm -hmm. but they also realize the importance of having, you know, strong lower legs and a strong lower half. They just don't know how to squat with their hips. Right. Yeah. Right. At least, at least a lot of them don't, but they do believe in the squat. I know like front squats are really popular or were really popular with skiers mm -hmm. uh, because they fell for the quad strength that they gained from it. Uh, They're missing the point. Yeah. When more aerial stuff became, um, uh, you know, uh, shoulder injury started happening a little bit more. So people started realizing to kind of work the shoulder. So there was a definite understanding of getting strength, mm. but there's certainly going to be that one component who's going to be focused on like, and I, I can kind of see it. They want to do like one legged jumps and ladder stuff. Like it's that stuff is okay for, for balance work, but it's not going to really do much for strength. Sure. Right. Cause ha like the half the battle and probably skiing is, you know, you got to learn how to, you know, if you're stumbling or something, uh, you, you got to learn how to get yourself back. Mm -hmm. So it's great at one end to get some sort of balance aspect in, um, like, you know, work on an indoor board or even jump rope and can help, you know, and there's guys who can jump on those BOSU balls and, and stick it. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, so I think some people mistake that like, Oh, I'm going to get really strong. Like you're not going to get strong jumping on a BOSU ball. Like it may help, right. You know, prevent a crash, but strength and balance is going to be what's, what's going to help. So if you just have balance and no strength, it's, it's not going to work out. So you, you kind of need a mix of both. But I think, I mean, it's a lot like Rip, Rip says. I mean, if I went back and did skiing, I mean, uh, you know, training more squats or, or deadlifts and probably Olympic cleans would help a ton to maintain strength and just do other, the other part or the dry land stuff would be more so, you know, for a freestyle, a lot of trampoline work mm -hmm. for the aerials, but probably just something just to help on balance. Right. It's a two-factor uh, model. So for those that aren't familiar, right. there's an article you can check out on startingstrength.com. And the two-factor model basically states that uh, for sports performance, you want to practice your sport because you're you're building the muscle memory, you're establishing the motor pathways to perform a specific physical task, and that requires practice and repetition. And then you're training to improve another physical aspect. Uh, so, so uh, the adaptation that we think is most worthwhile for basically athletes to, to varying degrees is strength. Um, other other can, other uh, adaptations you can train um, include conditioning, for example, um, but that's basically it, right? So so practice your sport. Um, don't do stuff that looks like your sport, but isn't isn't you know exactly what you would do on the slopes, for example. Unless unless you have to, like the aerial stuff makes sense because you're you're then practicing how to rotate midair type stuff. But you know, um, instead of balancing on a Bosu ball, maybe increase your balance by squatting and deadlifting right because when you get stronger right. your balance improves at the same time for sure yeah yeah because i've noticed that since my squat has gone up like i mean the feeling uh on the front of my boots that i'm able to get or if i bobble it's just you would think like strength takes away touch but you know my touch has increased i mean like i said i know like i need to get more dynamic but it's probably because i'm like oh man i'm this beast that I can just lean into this and do this. Yeah. Um, you know, so the dynamic stuff would be more how I'm working my feet a little bit, but you know, you can kind of, it's just like, geez, I can feel way more what's going on in the front of my boots because yeah. I'm staying way more in the front of my boots. I had the same thought, uh, when I started strength training for Muay Thai, you know, we do a lot of, uh, single leg stuff. Like when you're checking a kick or when you're balancing on one leg to throw a roundhouse kick or a front kick, um, and as a heavier guy, that's a lot stronger. My ability to just plant on one foot and adjust uh, with with finite control and finesse, um, and and I could take 
uh, impact. I could take punishment on one leg and not get knocked over. I'm like, man, this really is a, uh, this is the X factor. I mean, this, this is the thing other than technique, obviously, that, that can truly change the way that I approach the sport and my ability to perform. I, I agree. I mean, I, I mean I'll, I'll, I'll piss off the haters right now. Not, I don't have anything against like split legged squats. I mean, I haven't done them, but I think, yeah, getting really good. I just said two, you know, your feet planted squat is it does more for your balance. Uh, you know, one footed balance and sitting up there, putting a leg back and doing some sort of split squat. Cause my issue is split squats for years. Right. And, you know, I think, I know enough about skiing when I was on my feet. Like, I was very, I was wondering like, what's going to happen here after this. I'm like, yeah, this is, this is way better. I have far more control and balance. Right. I mean, granted, yeah, I've been skiing since I've been two years old. Um, but I could just tell like, this is just, just, yeah, I don't feel like, oh, my left leg is a little loose or my right knee is a little lanky right now. It's just like, no, both feet are there. And if one's getting away from me, I can pull it back much quicker. That's the tricky part about sports preparation. Um, if it sounds plausible that it might help or it looks like it might help, neither of those things actually mean that it will help. Um, and the thing yeah. that may not look like it has anything to do with your sport, like standing up with 600 pounds on the bar, um, will actually have a profound difference on your ability to perform. So it's, it's counterintuitive, but, but I think uh, the more we do this kind of stuff, the more we spread the word and, you know, we'll just provide the evidence. Right. So and I, yeah, my buddy, Chris is the coach. He's, he's been, he's been eyeing it. So he's, uh, he's curious. Nice. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Let's get his skier strong and see what they can do. Um, yeah. and what other areas of your life have things improved? What's changed for you other than you're big and strong and skiing is more enjoyable. You're less prone to injury. Um, what other things have you noticed day to day? I mean, it's a lot, I mean, I've always, I mean, I've always, I mean, it's, Geez, I started working out when I was 17 and I didn't really miss, you know, much in the gym. It, it was cool that I just, I've always wanted to put on mass and was, and I tried a lot and I think I did good things before, but it was cool putting on 35 pounds, you know, at starting strength. But, I, you know, for me, there's, there's definitely a, a, uh, there's a meditative aspect to lifting. So, I mean, I, I couldn't sit and meditate. My mind ruminates and I love how it ruminates. I, I couldn't sit there and zone out. So it's just, that would drive me nuts. You know, I can read for hours, but sitting there, um, yeah, no, no, <laughs> no way. Um, so there's certainly a meditative aspect to it. Uh, you know, I, I'm fortunate that I can work for myself and set my own hours, but I know on you know the days I lift after work, I'm, I'm really excited to get in there. Hmm. Uh, the other element that I like, I mean, starting strength is kind of addictive. Uh, you know, and me competing in my past, you know, I don't look at the board and I'm like, oh man, this guy is going to get me. But I, I definitely like that sort of, I'm much more competing against myself kind of introvert. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just love that element of the programming and going up every time. Or, you know, if, if I fail, kind of like, oh, I got to come back and see how I can get it, get it the next time. So there's mm -hmm. kind of this addictive quality to me where it's kind of this old competitive juice to kind of keep going. Nice. Uh, so our you little know, leaderboard I, trick in the gyms worked for you then. When you walk in, you see your name up there. You're like, well, I wouldn't mind being number one. Yeah, that, I mean, that definitely, definitely hits my, yeah. So I, I see that. I'm like, all right, I can, I can get it. <laughs> uh, but I think the other element is, is, I mean, I've definitely lucked out with, you know, kind of the guys around me in the class. You know, there's, there's a lot of good shit talking going on. <laughs> uh, so I think that helps. But there's always, you know, there's always support. Uh, it's always it's obviously motivating. We're not, no one's trying to really shit on the other. It's, you know, there's good shit talking going on, but there's always good support. Uh, you know, and I think that I really do love that atmosphere. By the way, are uh, you number one in the squat too? I am. I, at least I was, I think I looked yesterday. So 545, I don't know if anyone is. is I was at the Boise that, gym but. yesterday and I believe I saw you at the top of, yeah, I thought it was 550, but. We'll yeah, I know there's, there's a couple of guys over 500, I think, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep, there's a few. Um, yeah. So what are your goals now? What, uh, I mean, shit, where are you going to go from here? Are you going to keep getting bigger and stronger? Are you going to try to maintain, which is, uh, uh, you know, a bit of an illusion? What's your, what are your, what are your thoughts now? <laughs> Maintenance and get ripped. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, it's um, upper body is the, is the big thing we're going to try to focus on. So that my upper body kind of uh, hit a wall a little bit. And I'm not sure if that's the genetics or, I mean, my right shoulder has been dislocated a bunch. I don't feel a pain anymore. Mm. Uh, but I know, yeah, my press struggles a little bit. Uh, and my bench is, my, you know, my bench is kind of, it always seems moody. You know, there's times I can crush the five by five or something. And the other times I, I fail on two mm. on the second set. And then I get all the rest. It's like, what happened? Mm. Um, so upper body, the, I mean, I, I'm like kicking myself. I, I should have like changed my flights So 495, five by five, because I was cooking along with it. Uh, at 490, I was like, oh, I definitely got, I'm only at four minutes of rest. Uh, I mean, I definitely got it. So I was like, I wanted to hit that. Um, you know, so upper body will be a big thing. And then lower body, I mean, the 600 pounds and even the squat after, because I, my back got injured last, uh, last year during the ski season. I actually think I'm theorizing that my hip pulled back into place. Because mm. uh, I popped on a, a deadlift, which was, was a little bit freaky. Mm. Uh, but then almost, you know, sometimes like if you, you crack your neck or you, know, you just feel better. So I'm like two weeks after I'm like, Oh man, I feel so much better. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, you know, it was a little bit scary at the time. Like, geez, this feels better. Um, you know, I knew it wasn't on the spine. It was, it's always to the, the left side, kind of above my hip. Hmm. Um, but then like squat and deadlift just kind of kept climbing up, um, you know, and rack pulls kept climbing up. So it just kind of snuck up on me. It's like, Oh my God, we're doing 500 today. Uh, you know, because my top set was doing good. And then when we reset after 545, again, it started climbing back up again. So before Amanda went over to you know, Portland, she put me on a 531. So that really just started climbing up again. Uh, so we'll see on, the, on my goals to the lower body, just kind of, you know, after ski season, we're going to take a little easier here through skiing because of the travel and everything. Mm -hmm. But then after a day, we'll just kind of see where, where it goes. So Amanda Shepard was your coach for most of your training progression at Denver. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. So we'll give yeah. her a little plug. She deserves it. She's great. Um, she's yeah, with, she, she did. Jared. Yeah, she did. Awesome. So, I mean, I, it was, uh, yeah, so it's almost, yeah, nearly two years with her. And now she's at uh, starting strength Beaverton for those of you that, uh, lived in the communist part of the country. Um, you can go and see her, you know? Well, that's why I deadlift 600. I mean, that's a real reason why I deadlift 600 pounds. It's, it's for the sins of the progressive left. <laughs> Do you mind if I ask if you're on testosterone? Uh, no, no testosterone. You son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah, no test. I don't, well, my, it's funny, my family, there's, there's people, some of my cousins are like, sure, you're natural. Right. I'm like, I am. It's, you know. All like right. if I need tests, I need it in my shoulders and chest. <laughs> let's uh, let's develop the Jim Clare uh, plan, okay? So, um, testosterone, two fifty five body weight, seven hundred pound deadlift. What do you think? <laughs> I could be there. <laughs> I mean, you're forty one. You may as well be on it, right? So, it's just you might as well go for it. Maybe heck, maybe yeah, go the whole Ronnie Coleman program. <laughs> That's a bit extreme. <laughs> Slightly yeah. outside yeah, of our yeah, scope. It's, yeah. It's all for that lift. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else? So I'm curious, do you have any uh have there been any any downsides? I mean, the the training time in the gym can be construed as downtime or a downside for some, but you've you've articulated as a, as a benefit because it's meditative for you. And I, I get that. For me, when I when I go train, I finally get to just put my damn phone away and get a little bit of clear headspace and uh, escape from the stress of work and all the responsibility of life um, and just sit there and do something that that's good for me for now. It makes me feel good in the moment. Um, it's good for me short term, how I look, how I feel. And I know it's good for me long term. So, so I don't see, although sometimes it's time to squeeze it. It's tough to squeeze it in. I don't see time in the gym as a downside. Um, you also mentioned, you know, the, the time required to eat properly um, can be a bit challenging. What, what are the downsides of this? I mean, it's tough to say because I'm always so optimistic on lifting. I think people have to make the biggest thing. I mean, I, I wrote marketing and everything in the fitness world for a long time for a lot of like the, you know, the scammy miracle stuff. And I've been around fitness and, and athletes. And the biggest thing is, you know, you 
at, at a base level, you have to make time to do something. And the more consistent that time is, the more you know that people get it done on on any level. So I mean, obviously, I think starting strength and the barbell training is fantastic. But if you know, if, if something can go in at a particular time and do it, whatever you know, at eight in the morning or you know, seven at night a certain amount of weeks that just works it's tricky to figure that out because obviously some people have schedules where they they are moved around you know professionals that's that's tough but you know the the downside and the only downside would be at least that i can imagine would be you know if someone has a schedule where they're they're constantly rotating it's it's tough to get in that consistent time Mm -hmm. if you can find something to do it i you know i say do it uh, and you're on a four-day split, right? Have been for a while. Yeah, four-day four split. Gotcha. Um, well, how how uh, how many times a week are you pressing at the moment? Uh, twice a week. Twice a week. You might yeah. like pressing four days a week. Yeah, I think we're. I think we might move in move into that while during skiing here. Nice. Yeah, especially if you've yeah. had shoulder issues in the past. Um, a body weight press would be would be a cool next step for for Mr. Jim Claire. Yeah, that would be. I mean. Uh, that'd be crazy yeah that i've been hearing that i should be able to do that i'm like that's 185 <laughs> you just got to keep pressing you just got to press more you can definitely do it i mean shit if yeah if you, i think with i think your athletic so. capability you know with a 600 pound deadlift yeah. you can you can press body weight no doubt yeah because my bench is sometimes okay so my 315 but like i said it gets a little moody uh but it would be cool to press the body weight yep and i'm hoping to get it there soon i think we're going to try to look for that this winter here Hell yeah. We'll get that up on social and YouTube and stuff when the time comes. Nice. Let's talk personal stuff for a minute. So what, uh, what do you do for work? Uh, I'm a writer. I guess you can start there. So I used to, um, yeah, it was a direct response copywriter and online marketing for about you know, close to 10 years, somewhere around there. Uh, in a lot of, you know, and especially in fitness supplements, uh, before then, the seduction offers. I saw and, a lot and, of crazy, crazy things. And direct response refers to your writing copy in order to get someone to take action on the ad that you've created. Is that right? Right. So I wrote, so if you ever go online and you like three vegetables that make you fat, uh, and then you click it and there's like a video that plays for about 40 minutes. So I wrote, used to write those things. And would you lie through your teeth that way or were you more honest than that? Um, <laughs> some of them were straight lies. Yeah. Oh, I mean, shit. I, and I've talked about, talked about that in my site. Um, yeah, that so, there's so much bullshit mm-hmm. out there. Um, you know, but we ran where I was, we ran on Google. So Google, you do have to, you have to try to be honest and mm-hmm. not everyone out there. I mean, I, I should, you know, preface that not everyone out there is dishonest sure. um just you know, most there's plenty people. that are yeah there's yeah, yeah. So there's the loudest ones in the room tend to be the most yeah like you can i lost 84 pounds in a week by sprinkling this in my morning coffee like sure you did 84 pounds in a week like go to the hospital <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah so i did that and then what happened was i i had a uh I, I had a change of, I guess you could say a, a found, you know, coming to Jesus moment where I'm like, I can't, I literally couldn't look at myself in the mirror anymore. Uh, so I did a 180 on it and started calling out uh, all of those people. And then I also write a lot on reading. Nice. What's your, when we were talking before this, this show started, you were giving me a bit of your philosophy on reading. Um, fill us in on that. Yeah. So with reading it, you know, I find that, you know, reading, a lot of people, gurus make reading sound like this life hack. Oh, you know, like there is a lot to learn in reading, but it's like, oh, you know, you can learn these tricks and get the three income secrets of this book. And you don't realize that the book stinks. Uh, you know, like leaders eat last or start with why, like no successful, like Warren Buffett never sat there and was like, oh, let me start with my why. You know, he just went and worked. Uh, and I know, you know, some of these guys behind the scenes are such, you know, they're idiot. They're really two-dimensional characters. Like they're so cardboard, it's it's not even funny. Does that include Sinek, by uh, the way? To start with, why guy? I'm just curious. Yeah, the Simon Sinek. Yeah. So, and a lot of these guys just rehash things, and some of them are, are well-meaning. Like someone can get a motivational boost, but it, it's kind of like, 
yeah, that's all it is. It's like a, it's like eating a caffeine gummy or something for a couple seconds, but right. it's not going to change your life. So, but the, the problem I find is that on one end, you know, they make reading like this weird life hack. So you're not taught to engage with a book. So like you, you look for uh, quotes that sound badass and the quote may sound badass, but that misses the context of the book, mm-hmm. um, which I think misses the deeper satisfaction, the deeper lessons in the book. And then the other side, people like they want to read more, but they're, well, I got to read, you know, they got to think they have to go pick up war and peace and start with that. It's like, no, you don't have to do that. Um, you know, find something that you can enjoy. So I kind of go into something about where you can engage with it, whether out of enjoyment or you do want to learn something with it or kind of, you know, find out a little bit more about something. I, uh, I hate to admit it, but man, I read so much less than I used to. I just find that I'm overstimulated throughout the day. All this technology, always looking at a screen when it comes to the end of the night and uh, I've got a, you know, I'm interested in, in reading the book. My attention span is so limited. Um, part of the reason is I'm not really excited about any any books at the moment. Like I love uh, Murakami for fiction. Um, I try not to read business books at night because then I can't sleep. I just have ideas and stuff. What are uh, what are the Jim Clare book recommendations that are satisfying and provide those deep lessons? Well, if your mind is running, I mean, the, the easiest thing to do is I would find something that you enjoy that you get engaged in first uh, and then just kind of make that habit. So, I mean, if it's a fiction book, you know, I mean, I love Raymond Chandler, the old school detective novels from the thirties. I mean, I'm a believer that all men should read Raymond Chandler. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, you know, t- the times are different. You know, if a dame acts up, you can't give her four Nembutals. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, yeah, times are a little different, but he, <laughs> um but something like that you know you know fiction books that you can get engaged with uh you know i think the robert galbraith which is actually jk rowling she wrote a detective series which i i think they are fantastic or you know something like james carr um his his uh jack reese series you know so something like that that gets you can get engaged and you can enjoy it but Mm -hmm. on the nonfiction side i think for engaging reads um Amity Schles, uh, she's uh, she wrote a biography on Calvin Coolidge, and then she has a book called The Forgotten Man, and uh, another one called The New Society. So she's a more conservative historian economist. Mm-hmm. Her writing is fantastic. Uh, you know, the book on Calvin Coolidge is is just utterly fantastic. Like she makes, I mean, she can make tax code very engaging. Mm-hmm. Um, and the race she writes, because, you know, on those historical topics, like something like The Forgotten Man, which talks about the, the New Deal of uh, FDR and the Depression. So everyone's like, uh, you know, FDR did so wonderful. But if you know history, he really did it. But some people think, well, he had to do something. Uh, Sounds like a COVID just, excuse. Right. But she just completely empirically rips off those those. Uh, those myths and mm. she does a great job of doing it and she isn't you know she's she's a very even-handed writer but but she's dangerous because she uses a lot of empirical evidence give me that name once more amity schles gotcha does she does she go into detail about the long-term effects of those uh new deal policies in in a sense it's 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 implied probably a little bit more towards the end of what happened mm-hmm. but you really see the change uh post the 20s you really see the change uh you know, in certain, you know, Democrat politics, in Republican politics, you see the particular changes that kind of became hard trenched that we see today. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, on the, it was FDR was really the first to instill the victimhood aspect. Right. Because uh, that really wasn't in the American spirit before. Powerful. Um, and, you know, and she shows that, yeah, Hoover made a lot of mistakes. There's no, there's no doubt. And he kind of, paved the way for FDR, but he isn't the total to blame. I mean, it's kind of him and FDR uh, made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. I mean, he, he's a complicated guy. He did a lot of wonderful things, but yeah, he just, his ego was to go, oh, I can fix this. And yeah, that was it. <laughs> once he, once he went in there to fix it, it was right. like, uh-oh. Yeah. It's a lesson yeah. that uh, politicians throughout the millennia have, have failed to come to realize, which is sometimes when you solve a problem, you make it worse. 
Yeah, but she's she's a fantastic writer. Her book on Calvin Coolidge was was I mean, all of them are, are fantastic, but she's really engaging. Uh, you know, she makes him a page turner. And I would say Thomas Sowell. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah, That's he's good. good but yeah, Emily Schles is, is is really good historian. Yep. Um, Who's the one that did uh, Benjamin Franklin and Jobs? Was that Isaacson? I those, think so. Those I don't know. Those are pretty damn good. I'm a fan of those. Yeah. I have to check out the Coolidge one because I enjoy those uh, historical biographies. Yeah, Coolidge is, yeah, he was something else. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Um, that's all I wanted to ask you about. Anything else you want to mention? No, nothing Nothing pops at the top of my head other than, uh, yeah, it's just starting strength is a lot more than three by five, you know, squat deadlift and press bench. Yeah. Well, I hope yeah. your story inspires people to uh, be consistent, if nothing else, you know. And I hope that's that, the um, biggest thing. Yeah, consistency, and I and I hope it dispels some of these myths that uh, you've got to get fat to get stronger. Um, yeah, no, like I didn't. I mean, at two thirty four, I mean, you could arguably say I was a little bit fluffy, but I don't. When I did that deck set, I think I was only like what seventeen percent. You were certainly not. Uh, fluffy. I think I was. Yeah, I think I was seventeen percent was the, my body fat, something like that. Yep. Um, and I and I hope the uh, the last myth that this story helps dispel is that strength is somehow a disadvantage. My buddy Adam Lawrence, said, a starting strength coach from Reno, says that no one has ever lost from being too strong. I don't know if that's his quote or not, but he's the one who who uh, constantly says that um, no one's ever lost from being too strong. Um, and right. body weight and body fat percentage are things that you can adjust based on your needs for your sport. Um, power to weight ratio and whatever else, but um, strength is an advantage. And some numbers that seem extreme to some people are extraordinarily beneficial. You know, a 600 pound deadlift is is a huge deadlift um, for for a you know a non pro strength athlete. Um, but man, it has a lot of crossover and benefit in daily life, doesn't it? Oh, for sure. I mean, I how I feel, how I sleep. Uh, I mean, even. I think it helps the writing, you know, I mean, it's not like, you know, some hater out there is like, go get strong. He's going to get strong and write better. I'm not saying that it's, it's just the mental uh, aspect and the physical feeling. Mental clarity, um, confidence, um, you know, all the stuff that comes along with being big and strong. Right. Cool. Yeah. It helps a ton. Well, Jim, thanks for the time, man. Uh, let's check in with you again when you're pressing body weight and um, thank you for being a, uh, you know, basically an ideal trainee and demonstrating what this, what this model can do for people if they apply it correctly in their lives. Yeah, no, that's, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's a wonderful model. I mean, it does get tough. You just got to keep grinding through it when it gets tough. Oh yeah. And, and, and stay disciplined. Yep. And then you get the psychological benefit too. Exactly. Yep. Cool. All right. Thank you, Jim. See you, man.